So I'm Matt Machin. Uh, I co coded the digital health software team based at the University of Manchester in the UK. And my team develops a range of different um, smartphone apps and other software for health projects looking at a range of different health conditions, in many cases, long term or chronic conditions. And I'm going to talk today a bit about how we have applied Scrum to these research software projects. In my team, I have a, I have six and a half FT equivalent um, RSEs, as well as other people who do project management work and user interface, user experience specialists. Um, so that gives you kind of a bit of a context for the size of team that I'm talking about when I, when I talk through this. So, um, it would appear that my slide, that slide's being a bit slow. Okay, so I'm I'm kind of going to go over two main areas today in the talk. First, I'm going to give it a bit of an introduction to Scrum, just go over the main points. It won't be a detailed um, description, but it will be an overview of, of what, how Scrum works. And I'll talk a bit about how we've applied this to research software projects. So things that have worked well and the challenges that we've faced and how our approach has changed over time. So what is Scrum? It's a modern agile software development methodology. It was developed in the 1990s and it has evolved quite a lot over time. It grew up in software. Nowadays, it is used in other industries, although I think software is probably still the area where it's used most. Um, it consists a very top level of three main elements. There's a team who have roles, there are a series of events or meetings, and there are some artifacts, so things that get created as part of the Scrum methodology. So in terms of team and roles, there are essentially three main roles within a Scrum team. There's the product owner, and this is the person who takes responsibility for the requirements. They own the requirements effectively. They're responsible for capturing them, documenting them, helping the team to decide on priorities. And they own one of the Scrum artifacts, which we'll come on to, which is called the product backlog. Um, so the product owner typically would interface with the research team, or it could be a member of the research project team. The Scrum master is responsible for the overall Scrum process. So they lead all of the Scrum meetings. They support the team. If the team has a problem, they will facilitate resolving those problems. They coach the team in the Scrum process. In fact, they're, they're there to guide and facilitate the team throughout the whole of the Scrum activity. Um, and then finally, we move on to the, the last part of the team, which is a software development team are probably mostly developers, but they could be database specialists or UI specialists. So they could be developers or team members. And these are the people who actually carry out the work. And when a Scrum sprint is planned, they commit as a group to the delivery. So um, it's not that an individual goes off and says what they will do, but the team as a whole commits. Okay, so moving on from there to the um, events or meetings. So the Scrum Sprint is a kind of the planning unit for Scrum. So it's a, a fixed length event of typically two to four weeks. In my own team, we, we normally use three weeks, um, which we found is a balance between being able to respond to changing requirements within a reasonable time, but also giving us enough time to deliver something useful within the Sprint. And they're focused on delivery, ideally of a single specific goal, perhaps sometimes in practice on a couple of goals. Um, and the idea is that the team will agree the goal and then they will work towards that goal for the, for the fixed length period for the sprint. Um, and the, the sprint is planned in a meeting called the sprint planning meeting. So that's where the goal or goals are agreed. And based on those goals and the prioritization of the requirements by the product owner, um, work items are added into the sprint, which will then be worked on once the sprint starts. At the end of the sprint, there are two meetings. Um, one is the sprint review, which is where <clears throat> some sort of demonstration is done of the sprint output. Um, 
to show what was achieved, even if it, what was achieved was not what was originally set out. And then there's a discussion and agreement about what changes are needed to what has been delivered. So if something was delivered wasn't quite right, then that might need to be changed. Or sometimes um, the customer might see what's been delivered and want to make some changes from that. And that could then be carried into a future sprint. And then there's the retrospective, which is um, different from the review in that it's more focused on the scrum process and the way that the work was carried out. And it's about learning from what went well, and what could be improved so that as a team, um, there's a, a process of continuous improvement and learning as you go along and improving the process and refining things. And then on a daily basis, there is a, what's called a daily scrum, where the developers or team members basically answer three questions. What they did yesterday, what they will do today and anything that's in their way. And the idea behind the daily scrum is it's a short meeting, probably 10 to 15 minutes, and it gives everybody in the development team a chance to find out what's going on. And if there are any issues to support each other, to resolve those with the scrum master facilitating and guiding that activity. Um, in terms of artifacts, the, the two most important artifacts in Scrum are called the product backlog and the sprint backlog. So the product backlog, thinking back to the team members, is owned by the product owner, and it's an ordered list of requirements and contains one or more product goals. So these are long-term goals, which might run for the duration of an entire project or at least a significant portion of a project. And the product owner will um, regularly revisit the product backlog and order the requirements based on um, the needs of the project. And then we have the sprint backlog, which is the um, effectively the list of activities that are going to be completed within a single sprint, within a single two to four week period. And the, within the sprint backlog, there is ideally one goal or perhaps a couple of goals. And that will be a short term goal. So it will be what's going to be achieved in the two to four weeks. Um, and it provides a real time view of work within a single sprint. So you can look at the sprint backlog and see um, what's already been completed within the sprint so far, what's currently in progress, what's yet to be done, whether there are any tickets or activities that are blocked. And the sprint backlog is owned by the dev team. It, it's important to understand that the, the sprint backlog is not owned just by the Scrum Master. Although the Scrum Master might guide the team in terms of prioritization of activities, it's ultimately the whole team that own the Sprint Backlog because they committed together to deliver um, on the Sprint goal or goals. Okay. Um, I was gonna stop at this point to invite questions about the Scrum process, but I'm, I'm aware that we're not a huge amount of time. So I don't know if we have, do we have any burning questions, Sandra? There is a question. So um, from Manuel Gatia Alvarez, in your experience, what's the minimum number of people you need in a team to apply Scrum efficiently? That's a really good question. Um, the guidance is about three to seven for a Scrum team to make it work. Um, so I think if you've got less than three, there's a question of how, uh, who fulfills all of those roles. And I will talk a little bit actually, as I, when I talk through some of the ways that we've changed over time about the challenges when the team's smaller. But yeah, so three to seven would be a typical uh, scrum size. I think less than three probably isn't the most effective way forward. Anything else, Sandra, before we move on? No, not at the moment, the thanks from Manuel. <laughs> Perfect. Okay, so I'm now going to talk a bit about how we've applied Scrum to software research projects. So I'm going to talk about the good stuff first, what's worked well, talk a little bit about some of the challenges that we... Oh, sorry, sorry. sorry. I, I overlooked one question. Okay, I... one. Sorry. So um, from Christoph, any tips on applying Scrum principles and hetero? genius teams where some of not all come from a non-development background, a non-dev background? Okay. 
Um, that's an interesting question. And maybe we should pick that up at the end. I would say it's not something I've done personally because I've always worked with people who are um, from a software background. But maybe we can pick up at the end when we talk about where the research team fits in. Maybe I'll cover the, cover, try and pick it up as I, as I talk through the, the next phase. Okay, thanks. Um, okay, so I'm gonna talk about the good stuff, what's worked well, what challenges have been faced, um, and a bit about how we changed our approach over time. So in terms of what worked well, um, from my, in my view, it, when you're planning out some software, you've got to have some means of deciding how to plan. And I, I think that Scrum has worked quite effectively as a way of planning. So you can decide on your short term goals, um, work towards those. But because you've got the, the product goals in the, the product backlog, then you've got some longer term goals and, and it helps you to have nice, short, focused activities, but without losing touch of the big picture. I think it's very good for team ownership and engagement. So because it's not the management come along and say to the developers, oh, you must do this, this, and this within the next three weeks, it's actually the team who decide what they can achieve and, and they own that and they commit to it as a team. So I think it's very good for engagement. Um, it's a good way of being able to pick up any issues or delays that occur because you're meeting for sure catch up every day and people are invited to share any um, challenges they're facing so it's a good way to pick up those issues very quickly much more effective than perhaps the team meeting once a week and the review and retrospective allows for getting regular feedback and improving the process along the way and i'd also say that it depends how you apply this but it, it can be quite a lightweight process so it doesn't need to eat up lots and lots of time in terms of some of the challenges, um, and these, there, there are general challenges here, but some of these are also quite specific to the research context. So um, anyone who's written a grant application before will know that you have to make some commitment within that grant application to what you're going to deliver. And um, there's a fixed amount of funding and the kind of agile approach of Scrum is kind of a little bit a square peg in a round hole with with this because um, you want to be able to be very flexible in Scrum and change the requirements, but ultimately you've still got some existing commitments in the grant application. And this can re require some careful thought and agreement with the project team. Sometimes it's challenging to get into, to get access to the, the key members of the research team. So if you're working with a, a principal investigator, a PI, who's quite senior, how much of their time can you actually get in order to to show them the software, get their views on what's the next priorities. And that, that can present some challenges. And what we have done in general is that we've tended to use a member of our own team, so typically one of the, the technical project manager to ask, act as a customer proxy so that they would meet with the um, research team and capture the requirements from them. And then they would act as the kind of um, the go-to person in terms of owning the requirements and, and, and be more available to our own team on a regular basis. That That's a reasonable compromise and I think it has worked in, in this environment. It's still never quite the same as being able to go to the actual customer and, and seeing what they think of something. So there's, there's definitely some thought there about how you set that up if you're doing it in a, in a research team. And there can be situations where the development team can lose sight of the overall project goals. So they they commit to a sprint goal and to a sprint and that and they beca can become very focused on that which is good but sometimes things will go wrong within a sprint and they won't consider the context of the wider overall project goal they just think about how to achieve the sprint goal and actually maybe sometimes the best thing is to change the plan for the sprint to reflect the changing situation and how that impacts on the overall project goals In terms of how our approach changed, one of the questions uh, previously about the size of the team, we initially had quite a small team. So there was a, there were, was me and uh, two or three other developers. And what happened in practice was that I acted as both the Scrum Master and Product Owner. In pure Scrum methodology, 
that is very bad. You should not have Scrum Master and Product Owner being the same person. It kind of worked, but it meant that I had to be very careful about thinking about exactly which hat I was wearing at different situations because the product owner is the person who's driving the requirements and driving the delivery and the scrum master is mainly supposed to be supporting, facilitating the team. They're quite different things. Um, as the team grew, so we were able to separate these roles. So we had some one of the team members being the scrum master and either I fulfilled the product owner or it's been one of the technical project managers who's done that. And we have made some changes to give the team better visibility and ownership of longer term goals. So although we plan the sprint goals, we then meet with the team less frequently and think about, right, what, what are our goals for the next three months looking across all of our projects? And then we put that down into a simple spreadsheet that they can readily see. And it just enables them to check back where are we with terms of the big picture. And I think most of the software engineers and, and the team don't really want to know what's coming in a year's time, but they want to know a bit more than just one sprint. So we've compromised a little bit there. And we've also started experimenting with different estimation approaches. So historically, we use the technical story points, which is kind of a relative measure of effort. Um, and that's worked reasonably well. The, the downside is that sometimes you get near to the end of a project and there's just lots of little bits of things to do and you end up spending lots of time creating individual tasks or tickets to track all of these things. And maybe that's not that most efficient. So we're, we, we've yet to complete this experiment really, but at the moment we are trying out um, just having one or two of the developers say to them, this is the goal, just go to that goal. Um, and let's not worry too much about having individual broken down tickets for every small activity because it just can get to be quite complicated. Okay, so finally to conclude before we come back to the question. So can Scrum be applied to research software projects? I would say it's a resounding yes. We've done it successfully and I think I've done within the team for probably seven or eight years and I think it has worked overall well. It does need careful consideration of the roles. So thinking about who the product owner is is very important and how you how you engage with the research team. And related to that is, is that from project to project, you might need to adjust your approach to reflect the relationship with the research team. So sometimes you might, if you've got a research team that's more available, maybe you can relate, work with them in a slightly different way. If you've got a team that where the PI is extremely senior, then maybe you have to think about slightly different ways of working with the research team to, to reflect that. And I think the final thing is don't treat it as we're applying Scrum, great job done, but actually regularly go back, review how it's working, improve the process. So things that we've done, like realizing that the team were a little bit lost in terms of the big picture, bringing those kinds of things. In. But I think if you if you can apply those principles correctly and just adjust to fit your own environment, then I think it can work really well. So I will stop sharing at that point and go back to questions. Thank you so much, Matt. Yeah, the first question maybe with the interdisciplinary team. Um, coming back to that. Yeah. Um, so in terms of our own team, we, the, the people who are acting as product owners, technical project managers, are not really software engineers as background. They, they've got more of a project management background. Um, and our UI UX designer is not a developer. And it has kind of worked in terms of getting them together. Um, I think the principles are the same. So, you know, the idea of getting people together on a regular basis, having people report on their progress, report on what it, any challenges that they've got. I, I think you could make that work in a, in a, with people who are not developers. Um, I, I guess my only caution is that I haven't, got a lot of personal experience of this other than having people within the development team who have other skills. I don't know, um, Christoph, Christoph, whether you want to come back on that or, or ask any more. So we are using at Noradem also Scrum. So therefore I was very interested to hear also your talk and your experiences. And our experience is really, as you said, product owner and Scrum don't have to be, Scrum master don't have to be developers. 
we have also different roles in the developer team. Um, if you really have people who don't have any developer background, I, I think it's a way to communicate. But if they are interested in developing, yeah, they will learn it also maybe with peer review and, you know, really, um, yeah, working with them on software engineering practices a little bit more intense maybe than with an existing de developer, that would be my take. But I give you now your next question, Matt. Sure. So from Sander Van der Berg, in science contributions are often attributed to individuals instead of teams. Think about publications. How do you solve that? That's a really good question. Um, and it, it's picking up specifically on publications first, and then we'll talk about wider contributions. So in terms of publications, um, I do get involved in publications. So I, my role, I'm not an academic. I'm a, I'm a, more on the professional services software engineering side, but I have a kind of pseudo role. So I, I do some academic type work. So I get involved in grant applications, publications. So I do first author some publications. I do contribute to others. Um, in terms of getting the team involved in that, so whenever there's a publication on which a team member has been involved in that project, they would always be offered the opportunity. In my experience, most people do not want to do that. Most software engineering people have not wanted to, but we always offer that if they want to do so. In terms of overall contribution, so I think it's really important, and this is something that's been fed back to me by team members very often, um, they want to know that somebody outside of the team recognizes that they've done something useful. So I would always do two things. One is try and get the PI to know who the developers are that are working on their project. And two, when they've done something good, get the PI to actually recognize that. So particularly if they've finished the end of the project, get the PI to write to all the members of the team, just a short email to say, to thank them and to make sure that it's visible. I don't know if you want to ask any further on that, Sven. No, thanks. Thanks. That's a good answer. Okay. So, um, Ash, you have your hand up, so you can unmute yourself. Hi. Um, thanks, Matt. That was a great talk. Um, I'm interested in the aspect of buy-in. So, in Scrum, from what I understand, you have this um, notion that in each sprint, you execute some of the tasks. And as you get further and further towards the end, you don't necessarily complete every single task. You just complete the highest priority. Now, in my experience, and this is what I'd like everyone's opinion on, really, and, and your advice, is typically the people that I've worked with, the stakeholders, they want all requirements delivered. <laughs> on time and 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 within budget. So I just wondered yeah. what, what your thoughts were on that. Um, another really good question. And I think in this probably uh, happens more in academia than in industry. I used to work in industry before I joined academia. Um, many PIs have lots and lots of ideas and therefore lots and lots of requirements, much more than ever could be delivered in within the budget. Um, and I think an absolutely critical part of making this work is the relationship between whoever is the front face of the software team, product owner usually, and the PI in the wider research team. So building that trust and understanding um, between the software team and the PI and the rest of the research team. So that over time, they get to understand that they can't just ask for everything and expect everything to be delivered. And in the real world, sometimes there are delays and sometimes things don't go according to plan. I think once they start to see success, so you have delivered something, then that helps with building that relationship. But it is absolutely a crucial thing. And I think, you know, if I was thinking about the role that I have, one of the most important things is building that relationship with the rest of the research. Um, Thank yeah, you. I, 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 thanks. Ash. Sorry. Yeah. 
Oh, okay. So sorry, I thought you you had another question. I did. No, no, I was just thanking Matt for his answer. I think my my internet cut out there, but that was a great thank. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, and I would add besides the relationship, um, what what I also like to do is um, giving them the option between what is the highest priority and um, must have features and nice to have features. If there's the room, they know they can get nice to have features, but not, you know, if, if the money is not all the time, it's not there anymore. It was nice to have. So, yeah. That's yeah, so use, using Moscow or something similar is a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So then they still feel like that, you know, it's taken seriously, but they also know. Okay, it's an engineering process. Maybe you know not everything as Matt says goes as as you would like to have it. So yeah, and certainly I've had the experience in the past where when I started working with the PI, they wondered what on earth it was that my team was doing. But over a period of time, they've come to understand enough and to trust, and actually the relationships become really strong over time. It, it, you're building, bringing together often two very different. Um, expertise areas and and working on that relationship yeah just to touch on that point i think that's a really interesting topic how do you build that relationship and that trust because i've struggled and i am struggling with that and you kind of you know try and increase the reputation of the it and the developers among non-developers who want things and you try and explain stuff so that's an interesting topic yeah i mean um, I think there's no substitute there for investment and time. Um, so trying to get the non-developers or your your PIs or whoever you're working with to actually understand at a basic level some of the challenges that you face. You know, without sharing with them too many gory details because they're not interested, but just at a top level, helping them to understand the basics of, you know, oh, we had this problem because Android changed their version and it broke the software getting them to understand those kinds of issues. Just yeah, I almost, I almost want to want to sit them down and say, you try and install our software and see how long it takes you to install that library <laughs> and watch them pull their hair out. Yeah, I think it, it it's very easy when you're not working in a particular domain to assume that it's easy. So it's, oh, well, it's only a button I'm asking for. How hard can it be? Um, and I, I think the only... The solution to that is just to try and over time educate, and it and it takes time. Somebody who's coming from a totally different background. I know we are already over the time. Do you have still um, time for another question, Matt? Yeah, sure. Good. So there's one going off your once they see some success. How can we manage expectations after the success? For example, if they begin to assume that progress will be always be this fast. Yeah, um, that's another another good question. And I think it's sharing enough with the project team that they understand um, what has gone well, what has not gone well. If something went better than expected, making sure they're aware that we delivered this great piece of software and actually it went faster than we thought because of X, Y, and Z, so that they understand and therefore their expectations are managed by that. Um, and again, it's building that relationship. That trust, you know, you can get to the point where the research team will trust you, even if they don't really understand what it is that you're doing. They might be frustrated at times, but they still ultimately they they've learned trust that you will, you know, you're ultimately doing the best that you can for them. Okay, great. Thanks.